by something had changed that was totally, absolutely unique. It wasn't religion. It wasn't just going to church. I was a preacher's kid. I was carried to church. I was made to go to church. I had to go on Wednesday nights. Do I get a witness? I had to go on every revival service. There was no time when the preacher's kid got to say, we went away for the weekend. I used to wonder, people would say, we go away for the weekend. I'd say, what's that like? And I knew at the age of 15, this wasn't just going down to an altar and saying a prayer. This was absolutely life-creating and life-altering. At the moment that happened, I was placed into Jesus Christ, and he was placed into me. I entered into a living person, a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Through the cross, he bore my sins and he took away the penalty. But through the power of the resurrection, the living life of Christ, he came to live inside of me. And something absolutely unique happened. That I wasn't saved because an event, I, an event that happened. Salvation came because he that died on the cross and he that rose again took away my sin and came to live inside of me. And now I was placed to him who was absolutely eternal, who was eternally living in the past and will be eternally living for all time. And he lives inside of me. He lives inside of you. And once he gets inside of you, he takes root and he never, 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 never lets up. Thank God, because I've let up on him so many times, so very often, and he just hangs on to me, says, I got you. I became the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now think about that. I became the acting, working, living resident. Of the residence of the God of creation, the God of redemption, abides in me and works in me every day. Now, second, along with that, he comes in, and once he builds me, that brings that re relationship, he asks me now to come into a responsible relationship with him so that now I can walk with him not just by his grace, but by, hang, by faith entering into that, I can go wherever his grace wants to take me. But this is part of me joining him in the process. I become a partner, a joint heir. I partner with him in new life, but it will constantly be me responding. We have got to get it out of our heads that grace requires nothing of us. The whole basis of the Christian life is this. God will initiate in grace. He constantly is. Even right now, I can feel and hear him saying, do this, go here. He's constantly leading. Because without his grace, I am constantly in a sense of second-guessing myself. Should I ever do this? What's the use? But he says, now trust me here. And as he goes and I respond in faith, I begin to see God open up things that in my life could have never been. So it's going to come up on the screen, grace requires a continual response of faith. It's not something I do in an event of time. It's every day I wake up, I go back, seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added. Meaning every day I go back to the source. I don't ever get to say, oh, I did that at 15. I wake every day and say, I need the gospel, I need the grace as much as I did at 15. I have to constantly be preaching the gospel to myself. It never changed. You are saved by grace through faith and that not of yourselves. It is not of works lest any man should boast. Every day I go back to grace. So what I'm getting ready to talk to you about, about the thorns, I want to tell you that the remedy is not you doing more. The remedy is God's mercy. The remedy is God's grace. Now, in the process of him asking me to be responsible to him, he asked me to join him on mission. He says, as the Father sent me, I am now sending you. I want you to do the work of redemption. You become an agent of redemption along with me. We are ambassadors for Christ. The problem that I see with so many is that we want the blessings, the experiences, and all the things of God, but we do not want to submit ourselves 
to the mandate to following him and obey him. It doesn't mean that his grace ever quit working. It doesn't mean that he quit loving you. It means that I stall out and say, I don't want to go where you want me to go. I don't want to do what you want me to do. I want to sit back with my arms folded like the stubborn kid that only wants his own way, and I want you to still bless me when I don't want to follow you. And God says, I wish I could do that. Son, I love you. Daughter, I love you. But I can't honor that. It's not the way I made you. You're out of design. And when you're out of design, you bring all kinds of things into your life that only grow and destroy. So if I'm going to experience, the next slide will come up, experience in the fullness of the Spirit requires fully surrendering to Him, to following Him in faithful obedience. I have to be doing that every moment. It doesn't mean that God is, if I don't, God's going to quit loving me. It's not the thing that he's going to take away my salvation. I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying God says, I have so much more. I have so much more. So much that I want to do in your life. So much that I want you to experience. But even those things that he wants you to experience are not always what you think they are. Because sometimes you will step out to where he wants you to go. And it gets really hard. And you think, Lord, you asked me to step into this. And he says, you're going to have to keep walking. He left this world after three and a half years, after rising, rising again, and those 12 or 13, 11 guys, and then Paul was added to that number, the apostles, and all of them except John died a cruel death. All of them. Was this God's blessing? Yes. Sometimes blessings come in very strange packages. I have had blessings in my life that I'm still trying to ask how can this be and how can you how can this be grace but I have to go back to what is true and not how I feel that ultimately everything will come back to God in control and God in grace and I have to believe that if that is not that is not so then I have no purpose this is when the Christian life gets hard and that's why so many of us, me included, waddle around in the briar bushes. Because the second truth I want to talk about is that though God is unshifting and undeviating, I am constantly shifting. I am constantly deviating. The tendency for my life is to deviate constantly into some kind of diversion to cast aside responsible relationship for diversion and substitutes, sometimes just because I'm seeking pleasures and sometimes just because I'm trying to kill the pain. And sometimes you can't tell the difference from the other one from the outside looking in. In Luke chapter 8, it described the thorny soil as this. And remember the rocky soil was that it, the, the seed dropped on the soil that looked good, but there was rock underneath. It was hard. But this is actually good soil, and it takes root. The problem is, is the garden is not tended very well, and so as the plants grow up, it's enmeshed in thorns. If you look at what Luke 8.14 says, it does not say they have no fruit. It says the fruit does not mature. It's that the fruit starts to come up. There is fruit there, but the pleasures of this world, the riches, the cares, choke it out. And it's blunted. It's blighted. It's stunted. In Mark chapter 4, it described the thorns this way. The cares of this world. The deceitfulness of riches. And the desire for other things. And you can say, yes, I'm going through all the motions, James. I'm here every Sunday. But if you really want to know the truth, I'm just barely making it. I'm just barely getting by. I am frustrated with life. I find myself constantly irritable. I constantly find myself running after some little silly thing. I'm spending hours on YouTube, hours on Facebook, hours on this, looking at stuff I shouldn't look at, looking at stuff that takes way too much time. I'm finding myself running after every little diversion, trying to get more, have this, feel better. 
and I'm anemic, I'm frustrated, and my life actually is indistinguishable from the lives of the world and the people around me. But I love Jesus. When Luke and that praise team sing, my heart weeps. Because that music for a while breaks through all the pain in my life and I sense the Holy Spirit calling me. And all of that stuff that is, for that moment... It seems like something grabs me that hasn't, and I am just weeping and crying. And, and enjoy, and, but when the time the Word comes, my mind can't process it because there's so much in it. I can't, there's a thousand thoughts at one time, and I may be able to comprehend five, but my mind is a constant, constant airwaves going through my head, and it's just constantly there. The condemnation, the frustration, the desire just to be left alone, to run, just to wallow in the briar patch. You know what I'm talking about? And there'll be some that say, yeah, well, you know, James, we have to live real life in the real world. I mean, you got to allow for certain things. you gotta, you got to deal with the stuff that screams at you. You've... You've got to make and have money. You, you've got to have my time and my stuff. And you've got to constantly, there are times you've got to get away. And you've got, to, you've got to have that. And the things that we have allowed that sometimes aren't necessarily sinful end up owning us. And then now, instead of there being something that actually brings peace to my soul, it brings me further and further away from peace. It's constantly drawing me further and further away. And it's not that God doesn't love me, and it's not that I don't love Him, and not that I don't sense the Holy Spirit, but I just can't seem to get on pace with Him. And now I have to cater to the stuff I've allowed, and it, 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 I have to obey it. And the result is, is that we, not really wanting to, but we do it anyway. We push the Holy Spirit down. We push Him out. We push His presence and His life away from us. And though the Holy Spirit is constantly there, and He is constantly full of grace, and He's constantly saying, come to me. Come on. My mind can't conceive how I will ever break loose of these chains. So there. And now, because I can't seem to get the Holy Spirit in the real world, I've relegated him to a religious world. And now I'm only having a trickle of the water of life and crumbs of the bread of life. And I should be marked by the fruit of the Spirit, which is the blood, joy, peace of the Holy Spirit just overflowing in my life. The very character of Jesus just there. Because the Holy Spirit is His Spirit. And I should just be constantly impacting my life. And then the gifts of the Spirit, how they now become tools and, 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 and service gifts that begin, and speaking gifts or whatever, that begin to impact the lives of others supernaturally. And I should be marked by that, but what I'm marked by are the thorns. I see a little tomato in there somewhere. I see a few little things, but what, and I look at your garden, though I see some fruit buried, and what really stands out are the thorns. And this is not ever how you wanted your garden. This is not how you wanted it to look, but you're so trapped in them, you have no idea. And so what begins to happen, and ultimately happens, is it creates a greater and greater dependency on the thorns. It takes more and more of the stuff, more and more of the, of, of, of the of riches or money, more and more of running after something else, more and more of that just to get by, and the holes in the purse, as Hosea says, get bigger and bigger. Haggai says. The holes in my life just get bigger and bigger, and everything I put in just roots out. And the worries get more and more. And that hedge of thorns around me just creates more and more pain and frustration in my life. It all comes down to one phrase. The desire for other things. Even as I say it, I want to rebel against that because I really don't want other things. I just don't know how to get hold of the real thing. 
And so because I don't know how to connect to the one thing, I end up going after some other that I ultimately know is only being good for a while. It's going to run out eventually, but I'm going to suck everything I can out of it until it runs out. So you come in prayer and you, you want to talk to God about the breakdown in your mind, the breakdown in your life, the breakdown in your relationships and in your marriage, or you go to the pastor and you're going to talk about the areas where your life is broken down and you know that you should be getting it together and just seemingly can and you go from one fight or one frustration and one thing after and that pastor sits down or you hear the Holy Spirit say to you, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow. Those things in your life have got to be let go of. And you say, you know what, Pastor, I really do, I really do want those things. I really do want Him. I really do just want Jesus. But I want the other too. I do want it, but I don't know how to let go. And so what I want to do is be able to seek the heart of God and take all of this with me. And God says, you know, that thing right there, it's got to go. And you've got to enter into my presence without it. And you Lord, I, Lord, it's so much a part of me now. It's such an appendage that the idea that I'm just going to let that go, and he's going to say, to let that go will be painful. That person you've allowed to come into your life that shouldn't be there, for you to let that person go will be like ripping flesh. That thing that you think you have to have that is so important for you to let it go means you have to totally look at your life in a different way and you don't want to do that. You keep wanting grace to conform to you and grace says, no, you must conform to me. How can that be grace? That is grace. If you had a child that brought home a cobra, would you say, listen, we're just going to gracefully love him and let him learn to play with the cobra? No, Grace would get the cobra out. Now the child's going to scream. It was a pretty picture. It was a pretty ribbon. They don't know what this thing is. They don't know it's death, but Grace does. And sometimes Grace seems so cruel because it says that thing that you're hanging on to is not what you think it is. And so what ends up happening is we say we want to be responsible, we want to walk with Him in this relationship, but I'll do that, I'll do that, Lord, I'll do that, whoever speaking to you, when all of the other stuff gets settled. <laughs> it never does get settled, does it? It only creates more problems. That junk never gets settled. It only creates bigger holes and greater pain. The holes get bigger. The pressures get more intense. The pain kills you. And you drift further and further away from God. I want his leadership, but I'm not sure I want his lordship. I want direction, but I don't know if I really want discipline. I want power, but I'm not sure I want purity. I want blessing, but I'm, I don't want it to come at the cost of brokenness. And there is no other way. The Holy Spirit transformed you and brought you out of darkness into light and every time you start going back to light, darkness he has to rip you out of it and you never come out of it without pain on the other side there's peace and we spend our whole lives avoiding pain not really and if you'll push through on the other side of it there is peace so we'll spend our whole life going up to it and say, I don't think I can deal with that. I don't think I can do that. Grace cannot be used as an excuse for self-absorbed living. Now I'm preaching this message because I need to hear it. The reason I chose this whole series is because I need this series probably more than you do. When I think about all of the stuff that I see people going through in their lives and all the years of counseling people and then the fellow I look at in the mirror, my heart is in anguish. 
of the stuff that is destroying us. And we play silly, self-focused, unwinnable games when God wants to offer his life to us and we would rather play in a thorn bush. It doesn't make any sense, does it? It's never rational. I have dealt with people, I have talked with this one, that it does not make any sense why I keep holding on to that, but I don't know how to let go of it. And it's become such a part of me that I've accepted that life's just thorny. The first few years that I would preach through this concept, I really, really drilled into the pleasures of life. But I find as I get older now, I find myself not so much trying to have the pleasures of life of just trying to somehow dealing with the pains of life. I don't want it to hurt anymore. And you thought you would go to church and you would go to the altar and pray a prayer and it would all come down on you like a flood and you would leave through here and the pain would never come back. Or you thought you would come here and you would lay it at the altar as we say. We give these pictures, leave it at the altar. I'm going to tell you, I do leave it at the altar, but between there, it's like a cat that you feed that always finds its way back. By the time I lay down at night, it's right back, and here we are. Oh, okay, I, th I thought I left you at church, but come on in. I can't. I can't close my eyes without seeing a little boy dying in the hospital. Some of you can't lay down without thinking of the death of a sister. You have to, and my stuff is this compared to some of what you've gone through. And I'm just stuck. I'm stuck in the briar patch. Just stuck. I don't want to be here. Lord, I'm stuck. So I'll say, I'll, I'm going to do better tomorrow. Tomorrow I'm going to do better. I'm going to have everybody praying for me. And tomorrow's when I rise up and I do something effective for Jesus. And I wake up the next day and it's still there. Without the grace of God, you will never ever escape it if anything has become more and more precious to me through the years is God's mercy that when you can't lift your hands and cry out with your heart he's there saying come on let me do it for you somewhere I've, I'm having to learn that the truth does set you free that I've got to take a tenacious hold on the gospel and preach it to myself every day. That the gospel of Christ, it is the gospel of Christ is the power of God for the deliverance of everyone who believes. That he is a way of escape. I'm not preaching this message to you that one who is on the other side and is telling you how to get where I am. I'm preaching this as one, it's where you are and we've got to find a way through. Now, I've got to get from here to here, and I don't see a path, and he's going to, the machete of the Holy Spirit's going to have to just whack one out, but I have got to get from these thorns to good soil. You see, the soil that you're on is good. It's just, it's tending that garden. I look around this room, and I see people who I love, that I know you have gone through terrible, terrible losses. I look at some that I know are battling something every day and you do not know how to let go of it. 
you're battling every day, how am I going to pay this bill to do this? And I don't know how I got this deeply in debt. And when I look at my life, all I can see is more of it. And I'm just hanging on. And I don't know how to, how to go to God. And I come to church and I want to do better. I want to live more. And the enemy is going to try to get you to discard the grace of God and think that you can do this yourself. If mortal life is going to grow, we have to be a people of great grace. Because in great grace, there is great power. We're going to have to be very kind and patient with each other. I look in the room, too, and I see some that are struggling with this whole concept of what it means to walk with Jesus. You will never, ever get past that. You will never, ever get past what does it mean to walk with Jesus. Just accept that we're all struggling with what it means to take the next step with Him. Come to me, all that are you weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If we're going to be a church that gets past the thorns, we're going to have to be a people that love each other. And we're going to have to allow people to fail you believe that or is that just something preachers say that's why this altar is so important this altar is not a place for us to parade ourselves and say look how good I'm doing the altar is a place where God's people humble themselves so that he can lift them up cast your burdens on me for he cares for you, he said. The only way I know how to end the sermon is saying, the only way out of the briar patch is the grace of God. I think over the last few weeks, as I begin this sermon series, if anything that I'm hearing is, we really... We really, really have not known how to tap into the ultimate powerful grace of God. That grace of God left heaven's throne and took upon it the form of a servant in the likeness of men and put himself on a cross and died for you. And he conquered sin and he conquered the grave and that grace will go (laughs) into a briar patch and bring you out. But you've got to come and cry and say, Lord, you've got to show me how because I cannot do it. But when he shows you what to let go of, you have to let go of it. I'd like to tell you that everything he's showing me to let go of, I've just said, okay. What I find him having to do is say, let go of it, Jay. And then I grab him, he says, no, let go of it. He'll pry my hand off eventually if I'll let him so with my heads bowed and eyes closed I believe there's some today that if you want your way out of the bar patch you're going to have to come and make the grace of God first of all your salvation and second of all the source of freedom in your life come on you come on come on Come on, this this altar needs to be a place of freedom. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. How do I heal my, my marriage? Two people seeking the heart of God that are willing to let God do what he has to do in their individual lives and quit trying to fix each other. How do you get past the thorns? You have to let the Holy Spirit guide you out. It's painful, but on the other side of it, there's peace. Come on. And as you're here, are you truly willing to say, Lord, you know what's there. The symptoms are anger and bitterness, but 
the root is I have a hurt and broken heart that I do not know how to let you heal. The symptoms are I'm running after one thing out of another, but the root of the problem is I don't know how to find any peace, so I'm rupting after something that will just give me a temporary thrill. My money seems to slip away, and the problem with that is that I keep allowing myself to use my money for myself instead of letting God make it his own. Oh, I'm just as guilty as any. Are you here today or there's some that says, listen, I want someone to pray with me so this thing can be broken? If so, God will in his time and in his way. And even though I struggle along with you, I do this, that he is one of his word, he is of his word and what he says he will do in his time and in his way as I join him responsibly to let him do it. Grace, when faith finds grace, it is amazing what can happen. Let's just take our time. altar today, but you know God is showing you that there's so many thorns. I'm just telling you, take that despair and put it on God. Take that frustration and take it to Him. Ultimately, ultimately, He is who He says He is, and He is good, and He is gracious, and He is at work. It's a delayed fuse. But you are at work. And though we've had some news today that for some ways kind of staggers us, we are absolutely confident that you are at work. And you will work what you want to do here. And we watch to see what that is. We love you. Thank you that your love and your grace is matchless and unfailing. Pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless. God bless. Huh? All right, head stand up. We're going to pass the baskets. If you've not, we're going to sing a song. So let's do that. Lord alive, as you're standing up, if you would take those baskets on your table and pass them to the side as we continue in worship.
love you. We thank you so much for your grace that we couldn't earn, that we don't deserve. We love you, Lord. Make us more like you this week. Let's break through to the other side to where you are. In your sweet name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you, more life. We'll see you next week. <laughs>